right, here we are back again for our fourth video with Joe. Joe has done a, a, an amazing job of pulling together all the loose threads, bringing the Sadducees, the, these literalist Jews, and these putting them together and coming and zeroing in on this fellow Nehemiah ben Huziel and showing how his story also impacts on what we're looking at in the 7th century. And then moving into Omar, this fellow Omar, who has such an impact, not only there in Jerusalem, uh, but also in what we now know today as possibly the person that we're looking for, the, the Muhammad of the 7th century. Now, we're going to continue with that because it's obvious in the last segment, we did, uh, Joe did talk about the fact that this Omar converted to Christianity. But who was it that was pivotal in that? And some of you want, probably want to know the name. The name he's going to introduce is this priest who is named Gabriel. Now, that's new to us. We haven't really heard that yet on Fander Film. But I've asked Joe to come back and to unpack this, to look at it, and, and show historically how this Gabriel is significant and who he is and where he came from and what his background is. So, Joe, you're there. I see your red star there. So good to have you on board. Say hello to everybody. Shalom, everybody. Help. Thank you for having me back again, uh, Jay. My, I'll just go through my methodology um, to, to explain how, how I work this out. Of course, you know I'm coming from the perspective of, of an interest in uh, Jewish studies, I suppose, Judaism or Middle Eastern Judaism um, and the rise of the Arab state. Because at the time when I came across certain things, looking at the story of Nehemiah ben Hushia and the time of the events uh, what, from my own interest in Judaism a long time ago, very long time ago, I uh, started to become aware of certain things when I was looking for the, the, the continuation of that story and, and looking to see if there was anything historical that could corroborate that, that story, Jewish artifacts in the 7th century. Um, the artifacts which were appearing, the new Jewish artifacts which were appearing, had already been claimed by, by Islam. In, in Islam, they hate the Umayyads. They've got nothing to do with the Umayyads. You know, the Abbasids deleted and got, got rid of somehow everything the Umayyads have to say. And they also don't like Jews very much, as, we, as you know. And so the idea that I came up with is that maybe, the, the, maybe they, they were trying to get rid of something Jewish about the Umayyads or the origin of the Umayyads. So um, those artifacts and starting to look at uh, you know, passages from fragments of the Quran, the Quranic materials, let's call them. And I was trying to compare it with poetry, Jewish poetry, and something called the Sefer Zadok as well, to try and see if there was any kind of correlation between those things. Um, and uh, just trying to pull together as many artifacts I could. I didn't care if somebody else has already claimed it for their history, whether it was Christian history or Islamic history, I didn't care. I was just wanting to pull all the artifacts together, which could be relevant, which looked Semitic, and I thought, put them on the table and started to build this story. Then once I had that, I, I've got, obviously I can't use the standard Islamic narrative um, because it's saying everything is belonged to Islam, but I started to look for... Um, anything from non-Islamic sources, hence, you know, Robert Hoyland's book, Islam as Others Saw It, was very useful for, for those sources, which could um, correspond to telling us the story of the Jews in the, in the, in the seventh century. And uh, then finally, once I had a kind of a picture, I thought that I should look to the standard Islamic narrative to see if there were any echoes. So that's the, the idea, is looking for echoes in the standard Islamic narrative. So this methodology allows us to establish corroborated facts, because if you have an echo in the standard Islamic narrative for something which you've already established based on the, um, the artifacts at hand and the records at hand, and then the non-Islamic uh, sources, which don't seem to be saying anything about the, uh, anything which is corresponding to the Islamic narrative, if it's, but it's talking about the rise of the Arab state, but these, these sources are not some things which are, are, are recorded in the Islamic narrative, then um, you've got an alternative story, haven't you? You've got an alternative history. And of, of course, it's much further north um, than the Islamic narrative. But then you can think, well, we've got all of this history. This whole story is building up in the north, and it's to do with a kind of uh, Jewish sects and, um, and the, 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 what we can call the rise of uh, sort of a messianism, messianic sort of uh, uh, belief amongst uh, Jewish sects in the north. And, um, 
And then you think, well, let's look for the, anything in the standard Islamic narrative which has got echoes. So we find that Omar is, is quite an interesting character and his journey, and, and also this Khaled and this Amr. So you've got three people that you can take from the standard Islamic narrative who seem to correspond, their actions, their movements seem to correspond to activities that are going up in the north. And you can sort of build a picture of at least at least one historical person who seems to have a lot of echoes and you've got some quite good cor corroboration. So, cor because if you want objective, you know, fact has to be objective. It can't be subjective. If, if something's subjective, um, it's not, uh, it's not good enough. You've got to have uh, objectivity and objectivity means witnesses who are independent. You can't have everything being told from one store, one side, the Abbasids and their narrative. It's not, uh, it's, it's subjective. It's all Abbasid. It's all one sided. So if we can find something from other witnesses, which is com corroborated in, in the standard Islamic narrative, then my idea, my, feel, my, my um, methodology is that we've probably got something factual here. We've got corroborated events. So we see corroboration with this Chinese event source, the, the Omar, Amr, Khalid uh, events. Just to remind people that um, these three names have very similar meanings, okay? Uh, all to do with uh, longevity, immortality, eternity. They've all got very similar sort of meanings there. So we have to... Um, uh, so we can we can say well probably they are being translated in, by different people. Looks like Khalid is the eastern uh, name for this person when it's translated. These sources, whatever the, these sources were, maybe they were Aramaic, maybe there was a different dialect of Arabic. When they were translated in eastern sources, it seems like they call him Khalid. When they were translated in western Arabic sources, it seems like they're calling him Amr. Um, later, the Abbasids decide to call him Omar. And um, the non-Islamic sources tend to call him Ambros or Amr or, or Amr or, um, or Emir, simply an Emir. Just point out that there is a difference in letter between the Aleph in Emir and the Ain in Omar and Amr. So there is a difference, but as foreigners could be writing it down, they wouldn't necessarily be interested in the small differences of pronunciation like that. Okay, so we get this person here and we see the echoes with the Islamic story. And there's, it was it just, I want to bring up some... Um, points which I saw, and if I can, just in the comments, somebody actually mentioned that there is this uh, story that Omar and Muhammad are actually going to rise from the same grave at the, at, the, at the day of resurrection. And that was an interesting echo, which I didn't know about. Um, I think it's called John P brought that up. And that was a very interesting echo because um, that just sort of, again, is sort of adding to the idea that Omar and Muhammad are the same person. If they're going to come from the same grave, <laughs> then they may be the same person. So if he's the, the historical Muhammad and he's doing all these activities in the north, these invasions in the north, and then he seems to, towards his end of his life, softens greatly towards Christianity. And at the end, we've got this um, coin, which is dated around 647 with Muhammad written on it from Robert Spencer's book. And um, it's a Byzantine coin. And it looks like the kind of Byzantine coins we have before with emperors holding crosses on them. But there's a few distinct things about this Byzantine coin. It, he, his face has been sort of wiped, but uh, and the word Muhammad has been written in Arabic on this coin, Muhammad. But uh, they'd left the, the cross on, holding a cross. <laughs> so it's like, well, they wiped his face, they put Muhammad on, but they thought, no, the cross is fine. He was holding a cross. That's right. I mean, this is a big, a big slap in the face to the idea that, no, no, these were just uh, Byzantine coins which were in circulation beforehand, if, and they didn't bother changing them. Well, they changed the face, they changed the, the word. It's very clear. I mean, there's, there's no argument you can bring against it. It's very clear that they thought the cross, holding a cross was fine. That's great. That's exactly what he was doing. That's him. So they left him holding the cross, even though they wiped the other things which is, um, I think it's indisputable. You can't argue that this is somehow a relic or leftover that they, they, or they got distracted <laughs> somehow and decided to leave him holding the cross. This is, this is the King Muhammad, the leader, holding a cross as a Christian leader. So he converted to Christianity. So what do we have for the, the, the echoes of a conversion in, in Islam? Well, we've got this story of Omar uh, killing his sister and then feeling remorse about it. And when he finds out that the words that she was reading on this jawbone were actually um, gentle words, 
And he, he, he was filled with grief about that and that the standard Islamic narrative says he converts to Islam following it. But what else is there on the conversion? So let's look at the story of Muhammad, right? Because the story of Muhammad in the standard Islamic narrative says that he was also converted at one point. He had an encounter with somebody called Gabriel in a cave in Hira, they say. Um, or he used to meditate in the caves of Hira, they say, and he had an encounter with this Gabriel and uh, he was shaken by it and he converted to a new religion. A new religion came to him at that point. So there was a kind of a conversion moment in the standard Islamic narrative con concerning Muhammad too. So, but we're, we're under the idea that this Muhammad and this Omar are the same person. So this conversion moment should be the same event. Is there any chance at all in history that, there, that this Omar Muhammad person in the north might have actually met a, somebody called Gabriel and, and was very delighted about the event? And, and then and maybe that happened before he minted these coins? Is, is that possible? Remarkably enough, yes it is. So the source is Gabriel of Cartmin. Uh, life, it's the life of Gabriel of Cartmin, part 12, um, uh, or volume 12 and part 72, which is on page 123. So uh, this is what it says, and I've just changed the uh, words a little bit to make them easier to understand. Okay, so it says, Lord Gabriel went to the Sultan of the Sons of Hagar, the converts, who was Omar ibn, um, ibn Khattab in the city of Chizre. I don't know the Turkish pronunciation, but that's how it's spelt in, in modern Turkish. It's in Turkey now. Um, I can't remember off my top of my head what the name of the original city was, but it's in that location. And Omar received him with great joy. And after a few days, the blessed man, that means Lord Gabriel, petitioned this ruler and received his signature to the statutes and laws, orders and prohibitions, judgments and precepts, pertaining to the Christians, to churches and monasteries and to priests and deacons that they should not pay the tax, which is I've put in here as jizya to remind you of the tax that Christians have to pay as dhimis to the um, Muslims. It's called the jizya. They didn't have to pay the tax and to monks that they be freed from any tax. They, they were free from any tax. Now that refers to if, if, if we've already got the jizya tax, which is what the, the dhimmis have to pay in an Islamic state, and uh, the Sadducees as literalists also had a similar view because that's taken from Sheba, who paid a, a, a sort of a, 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 a dhimmi tax to Solomon, if you remember. Um, um, so, uh, but they were freed from any tax. And there is a second tax. If you remember in Islam, there's this secondary tax uh, which is uh, called zakat, ch charity. So you've got you've got jizya for the dhimis and zakat, which Muslims pay. Um, but these ones are freed from any tax. It means they don't even have to pay zakat. What does that mean? It means that they would have been supported by zakat. They were ones who were qualified to be supported by zakat. Now, in Islam, the only people who are allowed to be supported by zakat are members of the same religion. And the zakat was taken from believers to support uh, poorer believers or the poor believers. So these uh, Christians or the specific monks are being freed from any tax, indicating that the, the zakat is going to be used to support them. So that's a very, right. yes. <laughs> so so that, and that's another way to say, listen, this, this suggests very clearly that, that he was also of the same belief that, that Gabriel was. Great yes. stuff. This is good. This is the kind of thing we're looking for. This is the kind of thing we're unpacking. So when it's mentioning these two different kinds of taxes here, the echo we have in the standard Islamic narrative of these two different kinds of taxes are exactly jizya and zakat. So uh, the fact that they're free from any means that they are the group which should be supported by those other people who are paying the zakat and they're definitely not zimi, zimis. So that's a strong indication that they were the same religion as this uh, Omar ibn Khattab at this point. Whatever religion he was beforehand, at this point, they were clearly of the same religion, or he considered them the same. And it's, noticed, it's, it's, it's important to notice that he, this is after a, um, a few days, I think they said here, I'm just trying to find it, uh, a few days, after a few days of meeting with this gentleman, 
uh, or sorry, this uh, warlord. <laughs> After a few days of meeting with this warlord, uh, the blessed man managed to get this uh, these taxes released. So we can imagine that this meeting may have taken a few days, and in that time, this conversion happened. And he said, "You know, we're on the same religion, so why should you pay any tax? In fact, you are not going to have to pay any tax. The tax will be supporting you." So also, it was ordered that the wooden gong should not be banned and that they may chant hymns before the beer when it comes out from the house to be buried. Together with many other customs, the governor, that's Omar, was pleased at the coming to him of the blessed man and the holy one, this is again Lord Gabriel, returned to the monastery with great joy. Notice also how he's only called Lord Gabriel in the monophysite like churches, they tend to call him more Gabriel, more Jibril, so this means Saint Gabriel. So this means that the this is the name that he was he was known best by as Saint Gabriel or just Lord Gabriel, and that's the name he's remembered by again echo in the standard Islamic narrative. So we actually have uh, something which fits into our historical story, our alternative narrative of the conversion of this son of Scripture, this convert uh, to um, or descendant of converts to uh, a form of Judaism called Sadhusi religion. Um, and his name was Omar. And now suddenly he's on the same page with these uh, monophysite Christians who are, who, who, who are uh, connected to uh, Gabriel, this Saint Gabriel um, of uh, Kartmin. So, a cor and it's also got an echo in the standard Islamic narrative with the conversion event, which changed a person into Muhammad as uh, in the standard Islamic narrative. Uh, I'll just talk about the source a little bit more. So this source that we're talking about was dismissed uh, by Robert Hoyland in his book as being unrealistic because it, unrealistic because it talks about wooden gongs, which uh, were assumed to be not used in the Oriental Orthodox churches at the time. But I found uh, the work of, it's a, it's a PhD thesis of somebody uh, called Sean O'Sullivan. It's called Early Umayyad Syria, a study of its origins and early developments. It's a thesis submitted for the degree of PhD at the University of St. Andrews. And uh, very importantly, he argues concerning this, uh, this, piece, this piece of evidence uh, that, um, should I just find that again? that uh, we cannot be certain about either the matters which dismiss it. The document is not considered to be authentic because, it's reference to, uh, because of its reference uh, to permitting public Christian worship seems anachronistic to the conquest period, and because it is held that Omar would not have con con condescended to making such a, a localised treaty. At the, but uh, the argument which we're presenting is showing that there is actually a possibility if we throw out the preconceived ideas of who Omar was and what he did, but if we look at the possibility, given all these evidences, that they're actually referring to the same person, um, uh, that, that he converted, then he would have indeed condescended to making such a treaty. It would have been very clear he, that, that that's what he would have exactly done if he was converted. So the only point left is this matter of the anachronistic uh, forms of worship. Uh, but this doctor, um, says that uh, one cannot be certain about either of these matters. So um, uh, he's, he's got his, uh, this is his PhD thesis. I imagine he knows uh, very well about the matters of Christian worship. And it refers to, of course, Omar's meeting with Gabriel, the monophysite metropolitan of Torabdin, who died in the year 648. And that's one year after uh, the, uh, 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 the date that, well, it's a confirmed date, scholars accept that this Muhammad coin uh, could be as early as 647. That's a confirmed date. It could be as early as 647. And this uh, Gabriel Monophysite uh, Metropolitan died in 648, one year later. So uh, the conversion, we imagine, could have happened sometime even before then, maybe 646, 645, 644, it's difficult to know exactly. Standard Islamic narrative says that Omar died in 644 in November. Um, it's possible that he was then, and there is also the story of this um, 
this uh, meeting of the emir who met with um, John of the Seder earlier in that year, I think it was April or March um, in um, 644, that he met with John of the Seder and had this discussion over the Gospels and decided to have the Gospels translated into Arabic. Um, so give time for that to, to, to happen. This would probably be the diatessaron, by the way, if we're talking about the, the Gospels in Arabic, the, the diatessaron would have been the one that they probably would have used. So, um, which is why it's called Injil in singular form in, in the Quran, because they would have been using the, the diatessaron, that's what it would have been talking about. So give time for that to be translated into Arabic and then him to read it. So he could have got converted just before he died in 644. Um, and this then event of the meeting with Gabriel would have been in 644. But then also consider the possibility that the standard Islamic narrative may have just put the, uh, November, the date six, November 644 in there in order to hide the fact that he was converted sometime after 644. And that, but that could have been then before, but any time between the translation of the documents by John of the Seder and the Tayaya at that time in, in, in March, April 644 until the, the minting of the coin in 647. So any time between 644 and 647, we have the, the, the possibility of a conversion. Perhaps he was converted for a while and perhaps they just said, no, he died in 644 in order to hide or cover up anything about a kind of a Christian king ruling in the area <laughs> in case people heard of it after 644, but until 647. So anyway, we've got this kind of area that we can start looking for something in there. And so this event is, is, is uh, about the meeting between Omar and this Gabriel, um, uh, uh, the Metropolitan of Torabdin. Before before you move on, what you're doing and what you're doing, basically what you're saying is this this meeting could have happened. This is perfectly legitimate. Yeah. The, the discussion that Hoyland brought up in his book was the difficulty of worshipping with wooden gongs. Yeah. But as O'Sullivan and them are saying, no, this is not a pro 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 problem because worship could have easily have been begun using wooden gongs, though yeah. wooden gongs would have been used much later. There's nothing to, to say that they, they were also not used that early. So don't dismiss them so quickly is what you're That's saying. That's right. Yes, if, although it wasn't something necessarily uh, widespread and commonly used throughout the Oriental Orthodox churches, we, sh we should also remember that the Oriental Orthodox Church was only coming together as a communion in the seventh century alongside, like almost competing with uh, the emergence of Islam amongst the Monophysites. The, uh, the very large group of Monophysite Christians, which Heraclius was very keen on trying to absorb into the Byzantine church, they're called Acephali or Akephali. Uh, Kephali refers to, or cephalic, you know, cephalic uh, areas of the brain. It means the head, the head, cephalus. So, so acephali means without head, without bishops, without um, a clergy, if you like. They were essentially, Nobody. they were a low church. They were essentially low church, uh, almost like a proto-Protestants, if you like, at very early Protestants, if you like, amongst the, 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 uh, uh, the monophysite churches. So in the 7th century, we know for a fact that there were kind of like almost evangelical uh, monophysite Christians in existence in the Middle East uh, who, who were charismatic. They followed people who they felt were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They didn't have um, people who, who uh, like a structured hierarchy of priests and bishops uh, like that. That's why they're called Asithali. Um, and they also were called Paulicani and they became known as Paulicians later. Um, that's a whole story in itself because the, the Alevis of Turkey and, and, and uh, the Kurdish Alevis believe that they descend from these Paulicians, and that's a very interesting point. But um, so we have these, 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 these monophysites, and then at the same time in the seventh century, we have the emergence of the Oriental Orthodox communion, which is where we have the, like the patriarch of the monophysites in, in Alexandria meeting with the patriarch of the monophysites in Syria, and the patriarch of the monophysites in uh, who are Armenian monophysites, they gradually have their meetings together and they establish a, like like a, a, a memorandum of understanding, if you like, to, to come into communion with each other and become a, an official organized Oriental Orthodox Church. And that starts to happen in the seventh century at the same time that uh, Islam or the Umayyads are developing Islam. So it's like there's a competition between them to absorb these monophysite believers, or to absorb these monophysite sort of charismatic uh, Christians, essentially. 
so this event happened after John of the Seders um, uh, Tayaya had translated the Gospels for him. And it's another clear sign that Omar was converting to the monophysite belief, I believe, the monophysite belief in Jesus. Because remember, the Quran is a monophysite text. Uh, that's argued by um, Gunter Lulling, who mentioned last time, and Peter von Sivers and um, uh, Luxembourg and others, yes, and myself included. So, um, and it leads to the strong possibility that at least some of the Quranic materials that Omar received could have even been posit poems about, for example, think about the, sle the seven sleepers of Ephesus, poems or texts written or introduced to him by this monophysite Gabriel, Syriac Orthodox Christian, or monophysite, Syriac or monophysite Orthodox Christian. And this is in keeping with the evidence discussed, as I said, by the, these uh, great scholars, that the chronic materials were from monophysite Christians. So, this is also yeah. what, what has been supported by the 2015 uh, discovery of those two folios in Birmingham, mm -hmm. Birmingham folios of chapter 18, 19, and 20, which also include the, the, the seven sleepers of, of Ephesus, also include James the Lesser, and also includes the story of Moses, all of which would have been in existence and would have been used and would have been passed around in that Arabic. Interesting, the Arabic that they used was an Arabic from much further north, not the Arabic that is Sabaic that would have been used in right. the Hijaz. I mean, we, might, we might even be looking at um, the exact pages which were given to Omar, um, written out specially for him in, uh, in his dialect by uh, this Gabriel specifically. And that could be the origin of the idea of Gabriel giving Muhammad the Quran, you see? It could exactly be this, this Birmingham manuscript. <laughs> okay, you've said it here. Let's see if this is what we're going to come And that's a great thing, what you've just said. Is this the Gabriel, not the Gabriel the angel, that the, as, the, as the standard Islamic narrative has now reinterpreted as? Yeah. It is no longer that Gabriel. It is actually just a priest called Gabriel. That's right. That's right. It could be this Saint Gabriel, not the other Saint Gabriel. Remember that in, in Orthodox churches, Saint Gabriel tends to, I mean, mean the angel Gabriel. Uh, and yeah. could be easily misunderstood as the angel Gabriel by by many people, um, especially if this is uh, being spread around by people who are generally generally illiterate. Uh, decades later, after the death of of Saint Gabriel of uh, of Kartmin, they may be just but thinking. Also, yeah. Do you think, Joe, this may be if you're a, if you are from the uh, the Abbasid, much later ninth and tenth century, and you want to give credibility to right. the book you have? And you want to give it a, a, a credibility that is an authority that is above man. Wouldn't yeah. it, it make sense then to take that Gabriel and make sure that this is the angel Gabriel so that this text is coming from God himself, not from man, not from someone as, as simple or as insignificant as a priest? Absolutely. You said it, Jay. That's exactly, that's exactly the, the matter of the fact. To, to gain, sort of give cr credibility to the religion. People know the story. They're working with a story that people know. Oh, yeah, Muhammad. Uh, well, he, he became Muhammad after he met Gabriel. People know that story. And, and basically, you're just controlling the, the packaging, if you like. All you're doing is taking the elements of the story and controlling the packaging to just mm -hmm. interpret it differently. So that's all you're doing as, as, as the, the Abbasid leaders. And it's, it would suit your agenda very well. So um, and then to, to teach them, you know, where they've gone wrong. Um, so uh, this, is, this is what I'm talking about, these echoes. So since I've written here the last slide, uh, since we should only use parts from the standard Islamic narrative which seem like an echo of an independently recorded event, uh, the end of Jiznia for Monify sites is more strong evidence that Omar had indeed converted, but not to a new religion called Islam. He converted to the Monify site belief in Jesus, which we see in the Quran, and it's a, it's, a, it's a Hebrew, it's compatible with the Hebrew tradition, this, this monophysite view. Um, uh, uh, light from light, you know, the angels are created from light, the same substance as we, we call God the Father, Ein Sof Or, un, infinite light. So he's of the same essence of the Father, if you like. Um, so um, that's, in, that's compatible with Judaism, that there is this angelic messenger who is light from light. We should probably go into another... Uh, video about that because people are going to challenge this as, as, as a view in Judaism, but I can explain that too. Everything I can explain. <laughs> so, so, um, so uh, but that is that is a, 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 the correct view of the of the uh, the Messiah in 
Judaism as he is right now until he comes as the son of David at the end of time to sort of establish, uh, you know, the messianic um, sort of era, I suppose, on the planet Earth. So um, he's converted this monophysite belief, and it was probably this Gabriel who converted him. So Omar was a Sadducee, converted to monophysite belief in Jesus. And remember that Leo the Isaurian mentions him as an author. He mentions Omar as an author of Islam's Quran. Uh, but if people the, know Leo the Isaurian. Leo the Isaurian is from the eighth century. So we're talking that's about right. 720s. That's right. So Leo the Isaurian mentions this Omar as one of the authors of Quran, perhaps because he has these pages from Gabriel. The revelation from Gabriel, <laughs> part of the liturgical writings, which remember in, in Syriac, is called Karyana. It, it means lectionary. These are liturgical writings. So, so Gabriel gives him the Karyana. Translate that, Gabriel gives him the Quran. That's <laughs> in Hebrew, it's Mikra, by the way. The, the word Karyana in Hebrew is Mikra, which is again what the, the sons of scripture believe in that because we, we we now think that the bible is called tanakh but this is a new name for it the, the from it's an, ac an acronym uh, sorry an acronym for um torah prophets and writings torah nevi'im ketuvim but the old name for the bible in hebrew was mikra which translated into syriac is karyana which translated into arabic is quran so again it just refers to biblical and liturgical writings so this Gabriel has introduced him to these writings, he's given these writings, and uh, he, uh, so that's the origin of that story. So the, st the standard Islamic narrative is just basically echoing a visit from Gabriel before his conversion. There we go. That's basically it. Echoing, and I would say expanding, and also creating more authority and giving it more substance, substance by putting it into God's hands rather than man's hands. Right. They're twisting the story. But the, the, for me, the only important point is the echo. I'm not interested in the elaborations. All I'm interested in the echo because the echo is a corroboration and it makes it not just a theory, but an objective mm -hmm. fact. And that's what's interesting for me. So as, do you have any comments at this point, uh, Jade? No, and I think this is a, a good place to wrap this one up because... It's terrific to see what you're doing. You're pulling in, and as you said at the very beginning of, of this episode, you, you want to look both at the historical material that's there. Now, you went to Hoyland, you found this story uh, uh, from Gabriel of Kartman. Hoyland throws it out just because he doesn't like the idea of wooden gongs that early without thinking through that, uh, that, that, that you should throw it out just on such a small category. But certainly... Uh, O'Sullivan comes back, uh, uh, Sean O'Sullivan, and says that this is a perfectly legitimate story to use. We can use it. And when you look at it, you will see that. And what I love what you've done is you've looked and, and you've unpacked it and said, if this is happening in the 640s, uh, when he meets Gabriel, Gabriel, the fact that he asks not to pay taxes, not to pay any of the jizya tax, and also the zakat tax. Now, there's another tax that you probably are not aware of, and that is the Haraj tax. The Haraj would be the land tax. Mm -hmm. it, I don't know if that would, that, I don't see that here. Well, that's the not Jinja mentioned. Tax. It says from the, any tax. So it, that would be included, I suppose, because it's any included, tax. Because those yeah. are the two main taxes that those who are outside were being, uh, uh, those who come from outside had to pay, the dimmies had to pay. For those people who don't know what we're talking about, dimmy means protected people. These are those who do not belong to the powers that be and so they would be they would have to pay a tax so that they could be protected from outsiders it's you might say these are the tax you pay for the military and for the upkeep of the country but mm -hmm. they don't they would have to pay for it because of the fact that they don't participate in the military they don't participate in the government they're not permitted to do so that's why they have to pay this jizya and the kharaj tax on their land the zakat was uniquely for the believers themselves and the fact that he is included in this, you're suggesting, am I hearing you correct, that he would also have been in the same religious, the same religion as Omar. So both Gabriel That's and Omar right. have been sharing the same faith. Okay, well, thanks so much. Listen, those of you who heard it, you've now heard it from Joe's own mouth. Uh, and go ahead and respond to it. We'll look at the comments and we'll try to come back. Now, we will be doing a set of Q&As. Uh, Joe uh, will be responding to your questions. We'll bring him back on board so that he can get to those questions which are serious. We're not going to be talking about, we're not going to go and refer to any of the trolling. We are interested in those who are engaging with this material publicly. God bless you. This has been great having you, Joe. Uh, they are 3,000 miles away. Joe and Jay, over and out. Thank you.